Warning, this podcast has stories of real-life events and true crime that happens every day. These stories may contain adult language and graphic or disturbing details not suitable for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to another episode of War Stories. I'm Tom. And I'm Chuck. I was just thinking the other day of how many times I've said, welcome to another episode of War Stories. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. And I realize I'm reflecting on the fact that I think we're on episode 244. So that's not counting locker room, by the way. So if we're on episode 244, and I don't know if I've ever missed an episode of War Stories, and if I have, uh, I if not, I've I've basically said that phrase or some variation of it like 240 times. <laughs> yeah, you've missed it. You've missed it uh, twice. Yeah. Twice. And uh, I w- that was with uh, uh, Matt. Nicole and Blue. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, no. And the third time with Matt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so like, but I didn't miss it this week. No. And uh, this week, our guest emailed us. Uh, so tell us about the email because, they again, once again, you email yeah. booking at warstories at gmail.com. <laughs> booking at warstories at gmail.com. And uh, anyway, booking.warstreetsgmail.com, oh. an email that I forwarded to you. Yeah, it was from Mailbag. Uh-huh. Help me out, guys, because if you send it to Mailbag and then he sends it to me, <laughs> it's a very good chance I'm going to respond and I'm going to respond back to him instead yeah, of the person who hit there reply. Was couple, <laughs> there was a couple of accidental ones where it Chuck happens. hit reply instead of reply all. And he emails yeah, me right. back and he goes, Oh, do you still want to come on? And I said, <laughs> I said, oh, it's me. <laughs> I'm on every week. <laughs> dum, dum. I was like, oh, uh-oh. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, yeah silly me, but please send it to booking. It's really easy. Yeah. Click the link in the bio, go to booking. Yeah. So anyway, this week, Anyways, so, the email we got. Yeah, so it's from uh, Donald Dunn. He's a retired Army veteran and CEO of the Gun Room Radio. Uh, Gun Room Radio Ooh, is a radio. project. I like the sound yeah, of that. Yeah, it sounds freaking awesome. When I saw that, I was like, done. Um, <laughs> Gun Room Radio is a project that was started to help veterans transition from military into music careers. Um, we Shannon, are a radio station that Shannon plays book. nothing. Oh, yeah, Shannon Book would be great for that. Yeah. Uh, they are a radio station that plays nothing but music by current veterans trying to get uh, into the music industry. So Nice. I thought that's a really solid um, thing. And yeah, right up our alley. Yeah, in the show anyway. We should. Yeah. Cause he's been doing some really awesome things and been tagging us on, on Facebook yeah, yeah. and stuff, but we should, we should have him back on. Uh, but this oh, week yeah. we have Donald. Uh, can I call you Donald Donald? Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> man. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks yeah. for coming on. Thanks for emailing us. So you, uh, I, I want you to tell us about the website towards the end. I want you to give us all the details, but we, we heard a little bit about it just now. Let's start with you and how you got to where you're at. And then at the, we'll, we'll get some of your stories and then we'll get to what you're doing now. Uh, okay. So yeah, tell us a little bit about you and how you got into the profession. So I started out I, just like most veterans. I joined the army, needed a good job, 94. What could go wrong? You know, pretty, pretty simple <laughs> nine to five job at that point. And, that was, uh, uh, that was the Clinton army, right? It sure was. Dude, you, you were in the army when Matt was in the Navy. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. All right. Anyway. Yep. So, uh, I joined, I went to, uh, the one place I said, you know, there's only one place I don't want to go. And that's Korea because I just got married and I didn't right. want to leave my wife for that year. And so I went to AIT and then I went to Korea and uh, <laughs> good old needs of the military. Because that's the way it works. Yep. That's, that's how it works, man. And Big so green uh, weenie. Uh, I spent the first year and a half away from the, the wife. And then I went to, you know, there can't be any place worse than that. And then, then I went to a place that's worse than that uh, at Fort Bliss. And I was actually thinking about getting out. Um, the uh, leadership was just shitty and and i hadn't had any positive experiences up to this point and uh, i hated fort bliss so bad that i decided i would re-enlist just to leave so i didn't have to stay there any longer <laughs> <laughs> I, I, i'm not kidding 
and probably the greatest, greatest reason for re-enlistment I've ever heard. And I've been doing this show a while. Do you, yeah, honestly, I, if I was stationed at 29 Palms in a year and a half, two years in or two and a half years in, they're like, hey, if you re-enlist right now, we'll get you out of here. I'm like, done, done. <laughs> yeah. Give me the, yep. get me out of here. Yeah. yeah. Man, I, I hated that place. I really did. And, uh, but, but it turned out to be a good, uh, good thing. Cause I mean, I credit that to the reason why I made it 20 years. Um, I went from there to Germany and I was in a real combat arms, in, uh, unit, not this fake Patriot shit. And, uh, I went there mechanized infantry and I got to see what real leadership is about, you know, NCOs that are really taking care of soldiers. And, uh, right. that motivated me to want to do more versus getting out. So I volunteered and went to uh, the special ops side. I went to uh, the 160th SOAR. I did 10 years with uh, the 160th. And uh, after that, I, I realized, you know, I was getting tired. I mean, between Bosnia and Germany and the 10 years that I was with there, I'd done 68 months between Bosnia, Iraq, and Afghanistan. So oh, I was tired. Wait, 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 you know what? I, I just realized new mothers, and veterans are the only people that track things in that many months. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> new moms true. are like, "This is my son. He's he's twenty three months." And you, you're, you're like, "I was I was I was deployed for sixty eight months." <laughs> <laughs> yep, I, I counted every one of them, man. I'm not gonna lie, right? You know? But and they weren't all bad. Um, but uh, and it gets old. It, it does. Sixty eight months is a long time. Yeah, it was twenty almost twenty percent of my career was spent in the desert. I, oh, I, don't, wow. I don't even go to the fucking beach anymore. I've seen enough sand to last the rest of my damn life. Yeah. You know, my wife's like, let's go to the beach. And I'm like, mm, I guess I'll put on a fake smile face. Yeah, you're Luke Skywalker at this point. You're like, I don't ever want to see that shit again. Oh, man. <laughs> for, for those that don't know, sand is your worst fucking enemy. Yeah. It yeah. gets in your weapons. It gets in your gear. It gets in your weapons. Yep. It gets Let, in your and, gear. <laughs> and let me it gets everywhere and let me let me explain right. something about sand for those of you who don't understand there's a there's a there is a weather condition that goes along hand in hand with sand if you are somewhere where there is sand you are also somewhere that is windy yep and yeah. you cannot unlink the two and if it, i don't i grew up going to the beach and i hate sand I, oh, it is. And I was, no, thank you. Yep. I'll tell you a funny story, man. You know, you cannot predict Kandahar weather. It, you just can't do it. And I, I came out of the tent one day and everything was orange. I mean, everything oh. was orange. And I was like, you know, this is early in, in, in the Afghanistan war. And I'm like, what the hell is this? And the next thing I know, it started raining mud balls. Like <laughs> Jesus was picking up mud balls and just chucking oh them at me. Gosh. And what had happened was there was a, a rainstorm above the sandstorm. And so as the water passed through the clouds, it was collecting mud and just chucking it at us. And I'm like, That's this is awesome. Like the weather wants us to leave, man. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I mean, I've, I've been in hail. I've never been in mud. Yeah, me neither. Till that day. It was a mud storm. Literally, it's raining That's mud. Wild. That's a new Slayer song, Raining Mud. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, man. But yeah, so I did I did those 68 months. And uh, you know, as I got older, the the 19 year olds ran faster and I decided uh Isn't that weird how that happens? I know, man. The further you get away from 19, the faster they run. <laughs> you know, I had I had a trick to it, man. I, I couldn't run fast anymore but I could run a long time very slowly. And so I would just say, okay, we're going to run eight miles today <laughs> and just right. take off running with them. That slowed their asses down. Oh, they yeah. Uh, me to breathe. Yeah. So, endurance. Yeah, man. Yeah. But it uh, reminds me of, I was going to say, I just, sorry. It reminds me of that scene from colors when they're sitting there and the old P3 is looking at the, uh, the young buck P2 and, we're looking at all those gangsters, and he's like, "We can go down and just go." Oh, no, he says the story of the Papa Bull and yeah. the Baby Bull. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's run down there and fuck one of them cows. And the Father Bull says, "No, son, let's walk down." 
fuck them all. Yeah. It was such a great scene. If you have not seen Colors, go see Co- Hodges. Like my son-in-law, he's he's he had never seen it, and he's a Marine. And when I showed it to him, and he's like, "Dude, Hodges, I love Hodges." He's, I'm like, "Right?" He's like, "Dude, I, I would." He's like a master sergeant. He's like a gunner. He's like, "I, I would have served with Hodges, man. That guy's so cool, you know." And so now, anything that Robert Duvall is in, he's like, "Oh, it's Hodges." <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, so I I left there and. uh Decided it was time to retire, man. So I, I, I took a uh, an overseas assignment because the wife wanted to stay there at Fort Stupid. I mean Fort Stewart, and uh, decided <laughs> the wife that, wanted to stay there. Yeah, the kids were at that point. The kids were getting close to their junior and senior years in high school, hmm. and she okay. didn't want to. She didn't want to move them, and uh, so I uh, I left there, went to Qatar, which I thought was okay. You you y'all are punishing me and putting me in this shit assignment, but it turned out to be an amazing assignment. I, I wore a military uniform like 20 minutes a week. So oh, wow. it, was, it was awesome. I, I also was the, I'm also the only person that has ever deployed from Qatar. Yeah. <laughs> so I got stuck deploying with our uh, post commander because I was in the special ops and the battalion or the post sergeant major was my first sergeant in Germany and knew that I volunteered to go there. So he wanted me to become that Colonel's driver because I had experience. And so, <laughs> I got stuck going back to Kandahar again. And uh, by that time it had changed, man. There's like dudes on mopeds delivering pizzas to people's tents and shit. And I'm like, <laughs> what the hell has happened to this place? But uh, <laughs> the Colonel's driver sounds like a period war movie made for women. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, man, it was the most boring deployment I have ever had. I, I literally had nothing to do. I was only there to drive him and wow. he never went anywhere. Never. Right. So just to have something to do, I washed the vehicle every single day and uh, I parked it. One day they called me and they're like, Hey, the Colonel's vehicle broke down. Can you come down and take a look at it? I'm like, thank you, Jesus. There's something to do. And I walked down there <clears throat> and uh, I walked in. I said, what's wrong? He, they said, uh, Oh, the passenger door squeaks. What? I just the passenger <laughs> door squeaks. Oh my gosh! I, wa- I walked over to the little janitor's closet, picked up some, uh, um, what do they call that shit? The WD forty? No, it was like a, a floor cleaner, like mop and glow type shit. Oh yeah, yeah. A pine yeah. saw. Yeah, a pine saw. That's it. There we so go. I went and grabbed some pine saw, walked over there and dumped it on the hinges, opened and closed it, shut it. Walked in, I said, it don't squeak no more. And they said, that's good. I said, and it smells good. So I walked off. <laughs> oh, yeah, so I that's, know. I mean, I can, I can understand if you're, if you're mm-hmm. relegated to using kitchen products to get the squeak out of doors for full birds, that yeah. getting out of the military starts to look more and more attractive. Yeah. I mean, so I, I came back from that and went to uh, an infantry unit uh, there at Fort Stewart. And uh, my plans was to retire from there. And as soon as I got there, they let me know that we were deploying. So then I went back to Ramadi. And, uh, you know, by this time, I was ready. I was burnt out, man. I did not want to go 15 seconds past 20 years. And I wasn't even sure I was going to make it 20 years at this point. And uh, I said, you know, this can't be that bad. The unit was going to Al-Assad. Al-Assad is like paradise man you know there's like four pools and life's just great you don't never get mortared because the perimeter was so big the the perimeter was like 10 miles out you know so you didn't have to worry about getting mortared life was good and i get there that's that's the airbase correct yeah yep and so i i get there and i'm like chilling hanging out and all of a sudden uh, my first son says hey uh they've got a a forward uh, base that they want us to set up a maintenance team out there for convoys. And I want you to take three or four guys out there and go set up a, a maintenance facility. So off to Ramadi, Iraq, I went to a shithole in the <laughs> middle of this town, you know, getting mortared every damn day. You hear there's an mm-hmm. Iraqi base right next to us. You know, I'd, I'd sit outside and listen to the 50 cows going off as, as they were getting their ass handed to them by somebody out in the city and uh man it just it sucked 
was like literally the worst deployment I'd ever had. And, uh, I came back and a year later I retired and, uh, you know, the, 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 what the real deciding factor, man, was the caliber of soldiers we were getting. Um, you know, this is, this is a real funny story, but it just gives you an idea of, of what we were getting. Our company commander got in trouble. Uh, hmm. so his punishment was the battalion commander said, you need to interview all of your soldiers and come back and tell me what you, you learned. Well, I had this soldier named private Thompson. I, I have no issues with saying his name because he's not smart enough to turn on a, on a radio or a TV. <laughs> I'm not even worried about him hearing anything, but, uh, so it was his turn to get interviewed and the commander calls me. I take him up there. We go in, he sits down and the commander goes, private Thompson, why'd you join the army? And this kid did not hesitate, man. He said, call of duty, sir. And, uh, commander looking and goes, I get that. You know, you, your family probably served your dad or somebody and, and you wanted to carry that on. And this kid yep. had the dumbest look on his face. <laughs> and he looked at me and I looked at the commander. I said, sir, I think he's talking about the video game. <laughs> uh, and the, and the kid goes, yes, yeah, sir. I was talking about call of duty. I thought the army was like <laughs> that, but it's not. Can you chapter me? That's Shut exactly what this kid up. said. The commander looked at me. I said, you called him in here. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> oh my God. No it shit, took, huh? It took me 18 months to get this kid out of the army. 18 months to get yeah. him out. They would not. That was let, what year was that? 2013. Okay, that tracks. Yep. That tracks. Because we had a kid in our unit, uh, I want to say in 2010. <clears throat> And he was just claiming PTSD and all this other shit. And I'm like, where'd you get PTSD, bro? And he was trying to say from all of us, you know, NCOs and stuff, yelling at him and, and all this stuff. And we actually had to go out into his fucking, his little uh, single wide trailer in the middle of some field that had no power to it, grab him out of this meth den and drag him back because he went AWOL. And we had to throw him, we just kidnapped him basically is what we did threw him in the fucking back of the car, brought him back, smoked him. And yeah, it took that long about to get out, but he just was that standard shit bag that yep. joined and was like, no, nah, I don't want to do this anymore. When he got there and just wanted anything to do to get out. It's yep. funny though. Call of duty, huh? Yeah, man. I, that, that's the one and only time this kid, man, I'm going to tell you, I had nothing but trouble with this kid, man. I think, you know, now that I think about these stories, I, I even all the way back to my first soldier was like an adventure. I'm starting to see a trend here, but <laughs> this kid, and we, we, we had a, this time period because, you know, everybody hated life so much that we were all getting DUIs and shit. So they, uh, um, they started making us talk to, we had to talk to every single person on Saturday and Sunday in the morning, find out what their plans were. If they were going to drink, advise them on how to drink and, and not to drive and, and everything else. And then I had to call my platoon sergeant or my first sergeant, tell him, and then he had to call the sergeant major and tell him what everybody in the co company's doing. Right. Mm. Stupid. This kid would not call me. I told everybody, call me at eight o'clock. Tell me what you're going to do. I'm going to write it down and let's enjoy the rest of our day. This kid would not call me. So I finally started, I made him, I told him, I said, look, from now on, you're going to get a text message with a location. Your ass is going to show up there and you are going to take a picture of you in a video telling me what you're going to do that day. And he got to see so many sites in Georgia. I had, <laughs> I had it from one end of Georgia to the other. I fucking love it. I fucking love the fuck, fuck games. Uh... Oh, man, but. You know, and, and, and I had to, I had to scare his wife to get him to do it. Cause he wouldn't have listened to me. So I told his wife that y'all are fixing to be starving to death. Cause we're going to kick him out of the army. And and so she forced him to, to toe the line and do the right shit. But, uh, man, <laughs> she's like, figure your shit out. We need the money. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. When I, when I chaptered him, I chaptered him for sexual assault. That's how I got rid of him. He, uh, oh, shit. his wife was like, nine months pregnant, eight months pregnant. And, uh, they hired some MP's wife to take baby pictures 
of her while she's pregnant, pregnancy pictures or whatever they call them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, that's how he got her number. And then he would like lay in his bed at like two o'clock in the morning texting this MP's wife. So you're going to get with me or what, man? You know, you want to see me tomorrow? Man, you look so good. And she's like, leave me alone. And so finally she told her husband, who was an MP, and they filed um, assault charges on him. And that's how I got rid of him. No shit, huh? Yeah. And she still came wow. begging to me not to kick him out. <laughs> please, oh, wow. that was please. your That was your last one? That was your first one? That No, that was the last one. The, my, that was the last my, one. First, my first one, man, to this day still blows me away. So I just got promoted to E5. He was one of the first soldiers I got. And uh, he comes to me like shortly after coming to Germany. And he goes, uh, hey, so how, how do I enroll my wife into high school? And I said, shut the fuck up. What? Oh, oh my God. I am not lying to you. I said, I said, <laughs> do, do what? He said, yeah. He said, uh, he said my, my wife uh, dropped out of high school to, uh, to get married and come over here. And he's like, I want her to finish uh, high school and get her. And so I'm thinking. Good for him. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I'm like, <laughs> so I did all the legwork on how do you get this 18-year-old girl into high school. And uh, we got her in. And for a few months, life seemed to be good. And oh, one day, I get a call to show up over to his house. Oh. Because him and his wife got into a fight. And he got pissed and decided he was going to go buy some weed. To, so he can mellow out. So she called the chaplain, the first sergeant, and CID. And when he came back, they were all sitting in his, his front room. And he walks <laughs> through the door with weed in his pocket. And uh, sh she's like, I just want him to stop doing drugs and playing this sob song. And he, and he literally oh. looked at her and goes, well, you know what? At least I'm not the one that's bringing these high school girls home and making me fuck them. <gasps> and I'm like, did oh. he really just say that? Oh, shit. So, so he got in trouble for adultery, oh. having sex with underage girls, and weed. It didn't take oh. long. Like, how, long, how long was that Briggs sentence? You know, wow. uh, 30 days. He got, he got or, yeah, 30 days. Um, it starts out at like 45, and then as long as you don't get in trouble, they deduct a day for uh, – every week or so that you, you don't get in trouble so hey, hey, real quick Damn. if you get if you get accused tried and convicted of a sex crime while you're in the military mm -hmm. do they report that shit to the registered sex the sex offender registry so it depends on what it is if uh in this case where it was him texting her and so forth they did not do a court martial and so mm -hmm. he got an article 15 which is non-judicial and uh then they send him on his way. Um, if you actually assault somebody in this guy's case, he yeah. got a court martial and yes, because any court martial is an automatic felony. Right. And you're and now a sex, and now you're a sex uh, offender. So and double jeopardy, it. correct? You do your yep. break time, then you go and do county yep. time. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Double fucking jeopardy. They don't care if it nope. happens. Also, I think if it changes, if it happens out in town, or if it happens on base too, because if it happens, no, it happens down, well, you know? so who, so they basically the the reason they have to become a registered sex offender is because of the uh, county prosecution, not because of the military prosecution. So, Correct. okay, so that's my question: is the military prosecution does not require them or make them become a registered sex offender? It's the fact that the military doesn't stand in the way of the county prosecution right. yep. or the state prosecution. Got it. Got it. Okay, yep. dude, we had a. Just like that, that law that came out when uh, any domestic violent crime, you right. cannot have a, you can't, ha you can't possess a uh, firearm, which means you are now non-deployable and the army no longer needs you. So they used to allow you to, to only have the weapon when you go to the range and have the weapon when you deploy, but now it's, nope, you cannot have a weapon. So they chapter you. Yeah. I mean, as a police officer, you got one shot. If you get popped for a misdemeanor domestic violence charge, the only shot is that the court will look at the case and grant you a one-time hall pass to keep your gun. And if they don't, your department can get rid of you. Yeah. 
different than my agency. That's crazy. It, it but is. Also yeah. depends if it was sustained or not too. For us, they'd straight up just fire you. Well, if the, the moment they found out if it was sustained, whether it's misdemeanor or, or felony, boom, gone. Yeah. But they took your gun oh. long before. We had a guy. Well, I didn't. We not we, but um, not my unit, but my next door neighbor. When I was living in Camp Lejeune, uh, North Carolina, <clears throat> he uh, got set up by, I guess, some people. I, I don't know. This is just the shit that I heard. But he was my next door neighbor, and I heard him get his ass beat, and I heard him go unconscious. And then the cops and FD show up and all that stuff. Long story short, he ended up banging the sister of one of his guys in his unit who was 16 or 17. And um, mm. he sent his kids away for the night. They had a party at the house, and we're like – uh, duplex neighbors so i we share a common wall and then next thing i know it's it's like midnight and he gets his ass beat and you hear the fighting you hear the scuffling i'm like what is going on i felt like i was in the room because it's such a thin wall <laughs> and long story short he got popped by uh jacksonville pd and then he went to the brig and he served something like fucking 12 or some some odd years and then had to do more time on the outside i was like holy shit yeah i mean his house was clean in a week. It was gone. Sucks, sucks. Like a ghost. Yeah. <laughs> so, <clears throat> Donald, you did time in the 160th soar. Mm -hmm. How was that? Man, that was the best 10 years of my military career. I'm not I'm not even going to lie. You know? So, I got there in 2000. Um, as a matter of fact, September of 2000. So, I went through Green, pl green Platoon for selection. And uh, I got to spend a year before all the deployments and everything started kicking in. And uh, our first deployment while I was there was February of 2002. So we were like the second or third battalion to actually rotate over. And uh, mm -hmm. man, it was, I couldn't have picked a better unit, especially now that I've done a, a deployment with the regular army versus the special ops side. Right. And I, I, I'll take that special ops side any given day. Life is so much better. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is, there's a lot more work and and you you do a lot more things but uh um everybody is like volunteered to be there so you know everybody rolls up their sleeves and and right. does whatever has to get done you know everybody's first name basis and uh, that's what i loved working about narco mm -hmm. was to get into that unit you had to want to get into that unit nobody nobody got ordered to be there it wasn't yeah. a unit that you got put into because you had fucked up right you had to want to be there and they only took guys that were good at their job and so you didn't have to deal with lops and career rookies and guys that were retired on duty so when yeah. you when you went out with the, the the specials you're dealing with guys that are already known for working hard and putting in effort and so it's it's like oh it's so nice to be around like-minded people that are willing to do like work hard play hard yeah you know oh, let's do some work ab absolutely you know and you know as i was a diesel mechanic that's that's what i did in the, in the military and uh you know then you go there and and you're you're going through seer school and and all these other advanced trainings and wow. then you you get sent over there and they're like hey Did you do that up here because there's a, there was a sears school up here in north no. idaho washington state no that was oh. on the east coast oh okay but, but uh um so then i you 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 get overseas and they're like hey we need a dart team a, a downed aircraft rescue team and so you know they're just grabbing people and saying hey we're gonna train you you and you so i became on the uh the dart team and uh you know it was one of those things you're like I don't, you know, that you'll never use this. You know, we're, we're too damn good. You know, we're the 160th. We're not going to get shot down. Right. And, right. Uh, you know, that worked great until 2005, you know, during Operation Red Wing when, um, you know, if you've seen that show, uh, The um, Lone Survivor. Lone Survivor, yeah. Yep. So I had just rotated back to the States um, about 10 days, 12 days before that happened and uh the the flight commander major reich you know two weeks ago i was briefing him slides and and uh complaining because he was a tough ass leader and hard on you and you know he treated me just like any of the other officers if, if i had misspelling on my slides or anything like that he made me correct them 
and uh, right. he was he was just a good leader. And uh, you know, you had Marcus Morales, probably the best flight medic I've ever seen in my life. Um, he's he was better than most doctors. He served with the 75th Ranger Battalion for multiple years and had multiple awards from those um, encounters. And, uh, you know, and then Kip Jacoby, another guy that always came up and and uh, was talking to me at the motor pool. And, you know, me and him would shoot the shit about cars and him and his fiance was building some raggedy ass G body, I think it was. And, uh, um, you know, he was going to propose to her and everything when he got back and Two weeks after getting back, you know, 12 days or so, come to work and uh, I find out that we had a downed aircraft that oh, they did not release who it was or, or what had happened. They just said it was bad. And uh, as we found out what had happened, you know, 16 people died that day. It was eight SEALs and, and eight 160th members. Um, that doesn't include the uh, uh, three, no, four, four guys, I think it was, that was on the With mountain marcus's team yeah you know they yeah. didn't include them so you you add them into it you're now at like 19 people that that died that day and uh wasn't it the single largest single day loss of special operations lives in u.s yep. history right yep mm -hmm. yeah. yep and so you know that that whole thing i mean i remember looking on predator feed watching as as they were um circling over the uh the wreckage site before you know, until they could go in there um to recover the bodies and sensitive items and everything else and uh you know you just ask yourself man how the hell did that happen right you right. know and uh wasn't it like a lucky rpg it was it was a, a guy or unlucky depending on who which side you were looking for. i will tell you they could probably never make that shot again you know right. they were I don't know if you know much about um, Chinooks, but when they land, the pilots are looking at the sky. They can't see the ground um, because right. they land backwards down. Right. So the crew chiefs are all looking out the windows, the side windows, and they're counting the pilot down to, the, to touch the ground. You got the seals that are on the back ready to come out. And uh, the back ramp was down and, and the RPG round went into the back through the back gate and uh, hit the internal yep. fuel tank. Oh, shit. Yeah, it was a luck. It was I, I had heard that it was went through the open door, and that's what was the yeah. Yep, it was. Uh, you know, <sighs> and and deployments changed after me for that man. You know, I mean, I think all of us, not just me, all of us had gotten to the point like we're just going to go do our job and come home. You know, nothing's going to happen to us. This is, you know, right. it is what it is, and and it happened. You know, when we got over there everybody would go out on mission. The people that were back would stand around a, a burn barrel or whatever. And we'd say some prayers and then stand there and talk and chat. And, you know, they came back and this wash, rinse, repeat. Nobody was ever hurt until that day. Wow. And uh, so it, it woke a lot of people up um, and it changed, you know, things, things about that changed for me as well. You know, ha having to help do the funerals um, hmm. and then helping Marcus's wife, you know, pack up their house to move and, and his kids run around. It, it kind of brought back memories like this could be my wife. Somebody could be here packing up her house. Right. You know? And and it really brought the reality of war home. You know, it was, it was a tough time. I mean, for the longest, man, I didn't, I never even talked about it. You know, if I did, right. I would break down in tears and, uh, do you think you felt untouchable up to that point? Oh, absolutely. Because I feel like th with that incident in particular, um, you know, we're so good at showing people how good we are. Yeah. And, you know, um, I go back to, I don't know if, if, um, if you ever read the book or saw the film, uh, Flight of the Intruder. I have uh, not. It was, it came around, came out, after Top Gun, it was like the movie people were trying to find another movie that was like a Top Gun, but it was set in Vietnam and it was about two pilots that, that steal an intruder and go do some damage. Right. But I remember the opening scene was a, a guy in a rice paddy with a long rifle single, you know, a Mosin Nagant 
like Russian. So, and he just cranks off around at this, you know, this A7 or A6 intruder that's going by, and it just happens to go right through the cockpit and kill the bombardier, right? Just yeah. stupid shot. And I remember thinking how that would probably shake me worse than like the movie Platoon, where you're on the ground, you're expecting, you know, rounds coming down range, right? And so I feel like with the special operations community and and probably, you know, military members in general, when you see these untouchable guys, these tier one guys that are, they're unkillable and yeah. they're, they're super deadly. And then it's not some amazingly great, brilliant plan that takes them down. It's some lucky shot from a goat farmer with an rpg yeah and that randomness of it i think is is enough to make you go god what the hell you know like really like i could i that's that's the that's the military equivalent of slipping and falling on a fucking banana peel yep a absolutely i mean Look at look at what caused that. If you go back to those chain of events, right? What right. caused all that to happen? It was a 13 and a 15 year old boy and an old ass goat herder. You're right. That's what started that whole chain of events. Yeah. Was the decision: Do we do we right. kill these guys or do we let them go? Right. Mm -hmm. And and I I don't think either one of the choices would have changed any of the outcome. Right. You know, um, both of them was going to result in the same thing either the Taliban was going to go looking for them when they didn't bring the goats back or you release them and they're going to go tell the Taliban it's, it was either or. Right. So there wasn't, there, there was just a shitty situation Yeah. all around, but yeah. I could see how that would like beyond combat or beyond some of the other stuff that you were, you were ready for. You were, you'd mentally prepared your, no, who's going to mentally prepare themselves for a, a Chinook, to be taken out from a lucky shot from a rocket. And even then the rocket propelled grenade, lucky shot takes them out when they happen to be full of spec ops guy. You know what I mean? Like it was such the, it, yeah, I, I could see why that would be. Are you like, that's an, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah. You know, I mean, at, at the end of the day, like, you, like you said, you can prepare yourself if you got shot. And right. if I, if I clear a room and it happens, you know, those situations, it's, it's one of two things is going to happen. I'm either going to win or I'm going to lose, you know, and you don't think about the, oh shit, what if this fluke thing happens? You yeah. Know? And so when, when that type of stuff happens, reality really does set in. You realize that what you're doing is not a, it's not a, a job. You can't be trained how to, how to make this widget on this assembly line, you know, like you can in factory. What we do, every mission is unique. You know, everything has a different situation and you can practice scenarios, but you're not going to cover everything. You can, what if the mission, you know, all day long. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it's tough, you know, and, and I've been on other sides where, you know, like you said, I, I thought I was prepared and everything else. And, and I got put in a few situations where I was like, holy shit, how did I get here? You know, right. we was on a schnook flying from Bagram back to Kandahar. And uh, I don't I don't know what was wrong with it. I seen the crew chiefs and everybody talking and and the sergeant major had his headgear on and he was listening. And next thing I know, we're on the ground, some sort of fuel related problem. And, and they had to set the aircraft down. And when you look out the windows of Chinooks that the windows have already been shot out of and you you're looking around and, and you're in the lowest part of the ground and everything's mountainous around you and you look up and you see the other aircraft circling above you like vultures, man, you quickly get a different perspective on, on your battlefield. And yeah. it, it changes the way things look really quick. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. So you, you end up retiring mm -hmm. and what we've talked about this on this show. So just, so you're aware, I don't know. I mean, 
it's not it's a it's a recurring theme but it's not a regular conversation mm -hmm. is that the military does a whole lot to prepare you to go to war yep they do nothing to prepare you to go home you know what i tell people is is the military will give you every tool you need to survive they're going to give you food shelter equipment even down to the emotions that you have how do you deal with the problem you deal with it with anger can't pass your pt test get pissed you know right. use that right. as fuel you know when you're fighting the enemy get mad right you know the anger is a gift mantra right and right. so when you get out and you start encountering civilian situations and you reach in that toolbox and and the only damn tool you have to pull out to to deal with the situation is anger it's right, the only emotion right. that you've learned mm -hmm. and uh you know i was by before i even got out man i was i was not in a good shape um things were changing about me and i wasn't noticing it my family was and and, and i talk about this in the, in the book that i just released but I wrote the book because most soldiers feel it is better to not tell their family about what has happened over there mm -hmm. than to talk about it when you get home. When you get home, you want to believe that you are protecting your family, right? Right. But then when you lose your shit, like I did, what is it that they're going to understand? Right. I never said anything to my, my wife knew. I mean, she didn't sleep in the same bed with me for two years because she was getting hit and elbowed and, and everything else. And, and she got tired of hearing me scream and, and I, I would wake up and sit up in the bed and, and she would ask me what's wrong. I said, it's a bad dream. And she'd say, well, what's it about? And I said, oh, I don't remember, you know, I wouldn't talk about it. I, right. I did not remember. I just didn't want to tell her. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, um, you know, there's, there's a great scene in, if any of you have never seen the movie heat, first of all, it's an amazing, it's an amazing cop flick action flick but there is a scene where al pacino is a cop he's talking to his wife and she, he i remember specifically he says so if i come home and i tell you that at work today some junky asshole put his newborn baby in the microwave because it wouldn't stop crying that's gonna make it better telling you exposing like, like telling you about that is going to make it somehow better yeah. No, it's, it's just going to contaminate you. Yeah. Right. And so there is that element of you don't have this stain on you. I don't want to stain you with it. Yep. Right. Yeah. I, <clears throat> Go ahead. I was gonna say a lot of it comes down, I think, to being that protector. I mean, you join the military because you want to be a protector law enforcement, you want to be a protector firefighter. You want to be a protector. You know, and so when these bad things happen to you, the first thing that comes into your mind is <clears throat> I need to protect my family and insulate them from this. And I don't want to tell them a little bit, maybe, but I, I can't tell them everything because if I do, it's it's going to be really rough on them. And I'm exposing to them all these micro traumas and things like that. And it's like, I don't want them to to have these bad images in their head. Um, but at some point, I think that when you're struggling you do have to have an outlet to talk to. And sometimes you might need to take that, that leap of faith with your loved one and just, just hope that they can understand where you're coming from and talk to them. And then uh, maybe I can help you get to someone else to talk to them. Yeah. That would be a little bit, a little bit better and, and still insulate them and protect them. But I think that the major thing is not wanting to expose your loved ones to all the traumas that you've suffered because you don't want them to feel like you do on a daily. Right. Did you have a moment where you realized that that was short-sighted and not like that? Was there an epiphany or was this something you realized over time? Like, how did you? No, man, I, I did the worst thing you could probably ever do as a father, man. And that was the moment. So this went on as I was going through the out processing, right? Mm -hmm. My temper was out of control. Um, I didn't file a VA claim for three years yeah. after I got out of the military because I got mad at the VA rep there at Fort Stewart. I, I came out of another briefing and he was, it was early in the morning and he was standing in front of his office and I had a VA appointment the next day to go through all my paperwork and everything. And I walked up to him and I said, Hey, I need to ask you a question. And he said, do you have an appointment? I said, no. 
my appointments tomorrow. I just have a question. He goes, well, today is uh, not a walk-in day. It's a appointment only. And he just turned around and went into his office. What a dick. Yeah. yeah and and I, I just looked at him. I said, well, you know what? Fuck you. I don't need your money. And I walked off and my temper and my pride and, and everything else that was going on with me screwed me uh, and made life harder when I did finally file my VA stuff. But at that point, I was in the mode of there's nothing wrong with me. The problem right. is everybody else. Right. And that was starting to cross over um, me against my family. I would go home, eat dinner. And after dinner, I'd get up and go to the bedroom because that's the only place I felt comfortable was by myself in the bedroom. And I didn't come back out until the next morning when it was time to go to work. And then when I did finally get out and started looking for a job, I looked for a job that would allow me to be alone. And so I started my own trucking company, bought a truck, and I got in a truck driving 11 hours a day, sleeping in sleeper by myself and on the road for six weeks at a time. And uh, all that did was put me in my head. And, mm -hmm. you know, then you, you, you get to the point where all the politics and everything started coming out. And then that just put me deeper and deeper and deeper. Well, one day there was a hurricane coming and my family's still out there in Georgia. And uh, so I, I turned around and started heading home to, uh, to be there at the house. I delivered the load and took off towards the house. And I got there. We boarded everything up. And uh, everybody, it seems like everybody in Georgia lives in trailers. So I was the, you know, out of everybody I knew, I was the only one in the house. So I had my daughter, her husband, my son, his girlfriend, her kid, her sister, her mom, my cousins, had all these people in this house. And, and it turned out to be a slow moving hurricane. And I was trapped in this house. And the anxiety was just building up and building up. And finally, mm -hmm. after the, the hurricane had passed and, and we were out, able to come out of the house, I went for a walk trying to, to get this anxiety to go away. Because the only thing that made it go away was a fight. You know, well, I'm, I'm going to guess it reminded you of being stuck in that town getting mortared or waiting to get mortared constantly. And even people are going to be like, what? No, no, he's a bit, no, no. I'm going to tell you right now, just the stress of being locked in a house with a bunch of people that you, that you don't normally get locked in a house with and then waiting for a natural disaster to happen will stir up the exact same emotions of sitting in your bunker waiting to get shelled. And the next thing you know, you are just as jacked up emotionally as you were back then. You know, I, I will tell you how bad, you know, about that time frame. I would, I would come home and do like a 36 hour reset at the house. And sometimes the anxiety of just the fact of going home was, was more than I could deal with. And I knew if I went home, there was just going to be a fight because that's eventually it was going to boil over and I was going to start a fight. So I would, there's been times that I slept 25 miles from my, from my house over the weekend and then went back out on the road for six weeks. Oh, know? wow because I didn't want to go home and, right. and that's how bad it went. Well, I went for a walk after that hurricane. And uh, when I came back, my son, you know, it didn't help. i still had the anxiety and my son and my wife got upset at each other. Um, he wanted to leave and uh, we were under a curfew and nobody was supposed to leave the house or the areas, you know, because of all the power lines that were down and everything. And uh, he wanted to go to his girlfriend's house to check on the house. And she didn't want him to go. And that's all it took for me to explode. I mean, I just lost it. I got in his face. It almost turned physical. My wife had to break us up. And before I could even think clearly, I threw my son out of the house the day after a hurricane. And that destroyed our relationship. That was already rocky to begin with. Right. So, right. You know, and uh, that was the moment where I knew you know, the problem isn't everybody else. There's mm -hmm. no normal dad that would throw their son out of the house, you know, after a hurricane. Not even knowing if he has a house right. they were living in. Right. You know? And so 
you know, me and my wife had been married since seventh grade or been together since seventh grade. We got married right out of high school. So, you know, and we're still married today and, and, uh, um, you know, going on almost 30, this July will be 30 years. But, uh, um, I will, I will say, you know, that period did put a, a huge void between us. Um, mm -hmm. and so I ended up closing my trucking company after COVID, um, just because I had gotten some help. I went and seen a, I wouldn't go to the VA. I still wouldn't swallow my pride right. to go file a VA claim. And I went to a, a civilian therapist who, um, luckily enough, turned out to be the guy that had set up the whole PTSD program for Fort Stewart and, and that town there. Um, oh, well. So he was a really, he was an amazing doctor. And uh, he put me on some medication. And, and, you know, at that point, I started leveling out. And then I, I seen for myself, you know, the, the damage that I have done. Um, and it doesn't feel good. It just kind of, it just kind of backs up and confirms what I've been saying in my head the whole time. I'm a piece of shit and right. I'm better off to not be alive. And then when you see it and you can't deny it anymore, nobody else did this stuff. I did it. Right. You know? So my mom got to the point where she had to have either a nursing home or somebody had to live with her. And, uh, financially my business wasn't doing very well. Um, I was undercapitalized and in debt up to my ears. And so, uh, and, and all that came from piss poor decision-making before I got help, you know? Sure. Um, mm -hmm. I, there was, I, I wanted a diesel pickup truck so bad. And one day I got mad at my son because I came home and when I got home, the truck was broke. Probably mm -hmm. nothing he did to it. It was just an right. old truck that broke, but I blamed him. And, and to, to rationalize that, I'm never going to let him break this truck again. So I got on Facebook and I traded the truck the next day for a piece of shit ass Camaro, you know, no rationalization in what the hell I'm doing. I gave a $10,000 truck for a $2,500 car. Mm -hmm. I gave away all my, my tools, the, the 78 Camaro that we had, that me and my son was supposed to restore together that had just sat there now because we don't talk to each other anymore. I gave away all the. I gave away all the parts. I gave away all the, the, everything that we had Threw a tub cover over it and let it sit there. Still sitting there today. Hmm. And, uh, you know, those are, those are years that I lost with my son over this. And so I ended up moving to Missouri, my wife and, and kids still live in Georgia. And, uh, the reason why was cause my mom was going to lose too many healthcare benefits because of the, how much income you're allowed to make when sure. she moved to Georgia. So I found a job in, uh, um, Missouri and I moved her to Missouri. And so I, I rent a place here at my house in Georgia that I take care of. And, uh, man, that's where everything turned out great for me. It allowed me time to take care of myself at this point. Right. I got enrolled in the VA. Uh, the therapy with the VA did not help. Did not, you know, just like everybody right. else does. And uh, I started podcasting, man. The show was originally called Two Drunk Dudes in a Gun Room. And uh, it was me and my old first aunt. And we just wanted all the soldiers that we served with to, to get back on Facebook and, and tell stories and laugh and just make sure everybody was okay because so many people was killing themselves. And uh, mm -hmm. So he owned a little gun business. And uh, when I suggested we do a podcast, he said, well, what would we call it? I said, well, we pretty much live in your gun room building guns and drinking beer. Why don't we just call it two drunk dudes in a gun room? And it was just a humorous, fun thing to do. And mm -hmm. uh, three quarters of the way through um, the first season, I realized that podcasting had became a form of therapy, man. Yeah. I was talking about things that I didn't even feel comfortable talking about with the VA, my wife. And right. I'm openly talking about it on recordings and it right. felt really good. Um, right. It wasn't the same for my buddy. And uh, after the end of season one, he dropped off. And uh, um, I apologize for my dogs, man. My wife, Sorry. my mom left. And so they're downstairs barking at every car that goes by. But uh, <laughs> um, 
they uh so i ended up uh he ended up falling off and i left it the same for season two um just in case he wanted to come back and that's when i started having uh veteran musicians that came on mm-hmm. and, and i found another problem that that they had that us podcasters have but it didn't matter to me because i had a job was trying to get seen trying to get heard yeah you know you yeah. unless you've got a shit ton of money or you just came up with something amazing and you go viral it's tough yeah and these guys are trying to pick up their dreams that they put on hold while they served and so i i've never really been a very thoughtful person so i just said you know what why don't we just start a radio station you know these veterans will just give me their music and we'll just play nothing but veteran music it'll be easy and i seen an ad that said start your own radio station for 39.95 well hell i'll do it well it it turned out to not be that easy All right <laughs> yeah it, it, it briefed well but yeah. uh there's a thing called copyright and everything else mm-hmm. And uh, even if the the veterans own their music, they do not have the right to allow you to play it because they sign uh, agreements with pros called uh, uh, performance rights organizations, uh, such as uh, BMI or or ASCAP. And they're the ones that go around making sure that you're not playing their music without paying. And Mm -hmm. so I paid for, I I found a group called uh, Operation Encore. And uh, they kind of gave me the gist of how the music business works. And they helped me and everything as far as get things lined up. So I started a business called it Gunroom Radio. And uh, I paid for the licensing from BMI and from ASCAP. And I started playing their their songs. We've now grown to uh, three channels. Um, nice. Channel Book is on there. Uh, he's been on there since it started. And... Uh, you know, I was there when he came out with his new song called Dear Mom. And oh, yeah. uh, an amazing song. He he is by far my favorite uh, artist. You know, um, his song, Not Alone, I listen to it all the time because that's what he had. That song was what when the, like when we had him on, he had not uh, not written the, the song uh, Your Mom yet, but he had, you know, just come out with or it, it, he was promoting that one. And it's an amazing yeah. song. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. That's pretty cool. Where can people find it? So you can go to gunroomradio.com mm-hmm. and you can, uh, all the stations are linked there. Um, doesn't require any sign in or anything like that unless you use the app. Um, but uh, you can find it there and you can go to whichever station. We have a vet mix. We have a rock station called Ranger Rockwave and we have um, a country station called Simplify Country. And uh, oh, nice. Yeah, and we, we came up with these names based off of how many artists were in that genre and what their branch was. And most mm-hmm. of the country branch was made up of uh, Navy and uh, um, country or Navy and uh, Marines. And the Army was the majority for the the uh, rock side. And uh, so that's where we came up with the names. And uh, man, it's been growing ever since. And then here recently, last three or four months, we started a roku channel and so we have what's called mmtv it's called military music television so where we've taken all these videos that these artists have made and put it on a roku channel for people to watch just like the old mtv days wow how do you how do you get something on roku um there's a couple different ways so roku's open source as far as uh um building but you can either code it yourself or there's no code uh, companies that will, will do it for you. Oh. Uh, it used to be really super simple. Um, awesome. They recently changed the way their policy is. So now you have to, you have to know some coding to, to build the, the app yourself. Hmm. But yep. If you build it yourself. Oh, you- <laughs> I know. You think what I'm thinking, Tom? Yeah. I mean, you know, you never know. All you right. Know a coder. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, hey, Donald, we appreciate you coming on. So give out those websites one more time. And then where do you want people to follow you? Where do you want people to keep up with you and see what you're doing? So the best way to follow me, because I'm, I'm super active in our author program that we have, it's called Words from Warriors. There's a magazine that comes out June 1st called uh, The Warrior Scroll. Um, all the veteran artists or, or veteran authors that have wrote books also write in our magazine. 
Um, mm, nice. One of the ways that we fund these projects, um, that and advertising, that's, that's, we don't, as of right now, because we haven't finished the 501c process, I, we have not been gone out asking for donations. Uh -huh. uh, but we do do advertising and that magazine. And then uh, the other way is uh, you can email me directly at uh, Donald Dunn at gunroomradio.com and uh, Donald Dunn on Facebook. You can follow me there as well. There you go. Awesome. Well, we appreciate you coming on. And, uh, you know, we always like to give our, our guests a chance to dedicate their episode. Um, I would dedicate this one to all the people that, that fell on that day with turbine 33. Well, that's a, just as good of a dedication as any for this episode and, uh, rest easy brothers. We got it from here. So Donald, thanks for coming on. Chuck, what do you have for us as we, wrap up? Well, I want to say uh, thank you, Donald. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story and sharing your your journey through uh, your 20 years in the service and then what happened after and what you're still doing and, and how you're still helping veterans. Thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to having you come back on again and sharing some, uh, some, some more stories from uh, your special ops days. That would be amazing. Um, I want to say I thank you, everyone, that. for listening. Oh, you're welcome, sir. Thank you, everyone, for listening. If you like today's podcast and the content we provide, please follow us and um, go to our Instagram and our Facebook. Our Instagram is at war underscore stories underscore official, and our Facebook is at war stories podcast. If you already listen to podcasts, you like our podcast, we're available on all major podcast streaming platforms Apple, uh, Spotify, Podbean, all that. You can also uh, go to our website and support us there at www.warstoriesofficial.com. We grab some gear. Uh, if you go to our Instagram or Facebook, click the link in the bio. You can get to all of our links, our socials, our YouTube page, everything, and our emails. Um, yep. If you have a story you want to share or you think you want to be featured on the show or you could be featured on the show, or show please go to booking.warstories at gmail.com. Again, that is booking.warstories at gmail.com. I can get you booked. We're always looking for law enforcement, veterans, firefighters, medics, also corrections officers, dispatchers, and nurses. And if you have a friend who you think would be a great fit, give them our info, show them our Instagram or Facebook, and uh, link us up. Thank you for the support. Stay safe. And until our next episode, come home with your shield or on it.